So everyone, thank you for uh, coming to see me talk to you about Replicator. Now, um, this is a burp extension I've developed to solve an issue um, that's, that I've hit when I was working as a pen tester. I now um, work at Port Swigger and uh, as well as helping out burp users, one of the things I do is look after the BAP store. Um, now, the story of this particular extension is um, when I was working as a pen tester, I often found there was difficulty getting developers to be able to understand some of the more complex issues. So you'd work really hard. You'd be three steps into this multi-stage process. You'd bypass some JavaScript validators. You'd bypass some server-side filter. And you'd get this really great vulnerability. But the problem is, you'd, you'd write this all up. And the recipient, they would struggle to know what to do with it. You'd get follow-up questions by email. They'd want to have a conference call to discuss it. It was a challenge. And what I've found from working with developers is what they want more than anything is to be able to reproduce an issue on their workstation. You can give them a strap test. You can give them a cord up. You could tell them the exact line in the file that has got a bug. You could even give them the link to Stack Overflow with three different highly recommended solutions. And still, what they want to do is replicate it on their workstation. Problem is, with some of these difficult security vulnerabilities, these issues can be hard to replicate. Now, when I was doing a, an earlier draft of this talk, I made a minor Freudian slip on that second bullet point, and I wrote, reproduction can be challenging. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, what I was trying to get at is, there can be technical things, like, for instance, <laughs> there can be all sorts of technical problems that can occur that can occur while you're trying to do this. And a good example would be if there's JavaScript validation on the site. So you go to the form, you put in your payload in the text field, and the JavaScript on the site kicks it out. Now, for a pen tester, that's easy to get around, but you have to use some kind of security tool, like Burt Proxy or one of the other lesser tools. <laughs> now, one of the ways that uh, my previous employer tried to deal with this was to keep a full copy of the request in the report. So your report would be long. You'd have a title, you'd have a description of the vulnerability, and you'd say, hey, you want to reproduce this? Here's the request. So the idea is the developer, they'd copy that, they'd paste it into some kind of raw HTTP tool, and they'd see this issue reproduce. The problem, however, is that there are normally session tokens in that request. So what you're testing, you can paste that in, and the issue reproduces. Now, by the time you've sent this report to your internal QA, and it's gone to the account manager, and it's been passed to the security manager, who's gone to a project manager, and eventually it lands on some developer's desk who's going to fix this, by this time, the token has expired. So they fire this raw request in their app, and they don't get any meaningful response. So, given all these issues, there is a need to do something better. And what we thought is, what if we could make replication as easy as saying T Earl Grey hot? And I'm going to show you the uh, solution that we came up with. Apologies if you can't read this at the back. There's a, there's a bit of a trade-off here between the font size and actually being able to fit everything on the screen. Now, just put your shoes yourself in the shoes of this developer. So they've had the pen test commissioned, they've received the report, and it's got these findings on it. Now, because the pen test company that did this particular job is super advanced and they're using replicator files, as well as receiving the PDF report, you also receive a replicator file. So you fire up your trusty copy of Burp Suite, and you can, in fact, do this in the community edition. And we load the file that we've received from the pen test company. 
Now we've just got a little security warning here because it's going to update our configuration. But this is cool. I, uh, I very much trust this pen test company, so I'm going to say yes here. Now what we've got, we've got a list of all the issues that have been found in this pen test. So this, there's, there's three in this particular pen test. Now, um, the very first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to see if I can reproduce the issues that have been sent. And the tool, it gives us a single button to do this. This is a slight moment of truth about whether my demo labs actually work or not. So we're going to hit test all. And all of them has come back as vulnerable, which at this stage is exactly what we want. So the pen test company have identified we're vulnerable and now we can reproduce that locally. Now, in this example, um, we had the pen test firm work on the staging version of the site. Um, but I'm not actually going to be deploying fixes there initially. I've got a private um, dev copy of the site. Um, so what we can do, uh, we can redirect the target. Uh, now, when we say yes to this, do we want to change all the targets um, for the requests and macros? It's going to do some magic under the hood. This magic under the hood was significantly more complex than I thought it was going to be initially, but hopefully it's going to work. Now, just as another test, we're just going to check that all these issues still replicate because there's always the, the concern that you've got a slightly different config on your dev versus your staging. So the next step is to test them all. And thankfully, they're all still vulnerable. Okay. Now, we can start working away um, at each issue. So the first one, SQL injection, the pen test report, this is going to have a description of why SQL injection is a problem, what the business impact is, and what strategies you can use to fix it. And I hope that these reports are going to be lovingly handwritten and not, in fact, copy and pasted from the burp output originally. So, having read and understood this, I'm going to go to um, my source code. Um, I'm, just, I'm just running a local VM here that's got the uh, vulnerable app on it. Now, if I move down this file a little bit, um, so there's two, two lines here. They both do the same thing. One of them is vulnerable to SQL injection, and one of them ain't. Um, bizarrely, in Python, the two lines look so similar, it's ridiculous. Um, but this one, this secure version that's currently commented out, I'm going to make that active, and I'm going to comment out the vulnerable version. Okay, so we think we've done a fix. The next thing we want to do is prove that this fix actually works. Now we can go back to the replicator tool here and we can try testing it again. Right, and it's resolved, which is good. Now there is uh, a little caveat in brackets there. It says resolved brackets tentative. Now, this has been a necessary inclusion based on some of my experiences uh, dealing with developers because, of course, what we want is for them to address the root cause of the issue. So if there's SQL injection, we want them to move to having a parameterized query. Unfortunately, time and time again, I've run into fixes where they've literally blocked the attack vector that we've reported. So there's always the worry that some different attack vector is going to um, you know, mean the vulnerability is still present. Now, one thing we can do to help deal with this, we can do an active scan of that. Oh, I've got that. Okay, that's fine. 
Okay, there's some really minor issues there that we don't greatly care about, but the crucial thing is this SQL injection issue seems to be fixed. So that's great. We can move on. So the next one on the list was cross-site scripting. Now, similarly, we can uh, we can look through the code, and we can find in this function here, the developer is following very poor practice in that they are taking a variable from a form parameter and they are dumping it straight in HTML without any escaping, which is the classic cross-site scripting attack. Now, if I uncomment this line here, it means we are going to escape less than characters. So I can quit out of here, I can rerun our labs, I can go back to Replicator, and I can try testing this issue. Okay, so it appears to be resolved. And actually, if we look uh, lower down on the screen, if you see this bit here, where previously there was a script tag echoed, the less than sign has now been escaped. So this isn't this is no longer going to fire up uh, JavaScript. Now, just like before, it might be a very good idea to do an active scan to see if the issue genuinely is resolved. Right. Now, this is more concerning because something has popped up on the target tab, and this time it's red. It's a high-risk issue. And it appears that we still have cross-site scripting. And in fact, if we look at this more closely, uh, in fact, we're better looking at the response to see this. Uh, what the active scanner has done there is it's found an alternative payload that's got through our very simple escaping. So the escaping was only removing a less than sign. In this example, the injection was into a value tag. So it's possible to have a, um, a cross-set script report without using the less than character. I don't know if you've used this p particular trick before. This is one of my favorites for going into an input tag in that you can use the on focus uh, handler to put some JavaScript when the when that object gets focused, and you can also give it the auto focus tag. So as soon as the page loads up, you don't need any user interaction. Your JavaScript payload is going to execute. Um, so from there, you can continue working through these things to fix all the issues, and then that would be a very good point to send your application back to the professional pen test company and have them do a retest. Um, and hopefully you're going to get the best benefit out of your retest. Because I, I can think of a number of times when I've been asked to uh, do a retest for a client and when I've come to look at it, nothing has changed in the behavior of the area that was vulnerable. Um, even if this can't prove things are fixed, it at least should stop that. Okay. So the, the key points that made this good for a developer, everything was embedded into a single file, so it can be passed from the pen tester to the developer, it can be passed around between development teams, it can be chucked on a SharePoint. Replication can be done in one click. So this is this is quite in line with agile and test-driven development. It's the sort of behavior that you want. It's adaptable to the environment. So the fact that the pen tester worked on blah, 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 staging.com doesn't prevent the developer then working on dev.com or, or whatever, whatever other environment. But the big thing to remember is that this is not a silver bullet in itself and that a manual retest is the way to prove that the issue is properly resolved. Okay, so that was the flow for developers. Um, but I, I think a lot of people in the audience here are pen testers. And you'll be asking, well, how do we make this replicator file? We need some kind of like workshop to help us craft this. And I'm going to show you exactly how we go about doing that now. Okay, so... Um, 
first thing I'm going to do is just to clear out what's in replicator. Now, you may not know this. If you hold down control when you click this tick in the extender tab, it does a quick reload. I only learned that quite recently. I wish I'd known it ages ago. Um, and what we can do is we can put replicate into tester view. So it's going to, we get a few more buttons and options now. Now, So I've been asked to do a pen test of this mydemostaging.com and in fact it turns out we've been given a, uh, a test account to use as well. Now I'm going to focus on the uh, kind of burp heavy workflow of, of doing the pen test. Um, we're not interested in my demo dev at this point, just it's my demo staging. Um, and I'm just going to clear these out before we carry on. Okay, so I can start by spidering the host just to find all the uh, um, all the different pages within the site, and we can do an active scan as well. Okay. Now, some of these um, I'm just I'm just going to delete because either they're low risk issues or because of the environment we're in, we don't actually care that the password is uh, is plain text. So we found this issue cross site scripting reflected. So this is something that we want to communicate to the developer, and we can right click it. And we get a context menu option here, which lets us send it to the replicator. Now, within replicator, because this was found by Active Scanner, it's able to automatically pick up most of the details. So we've got um, a title for the issue. We've also got the path and parameter, which are normally key bits of information that developers want to see. And here on the left, there's a probe request. So this is a request that will trigger the vulnerability. And the other thing we've got is detection logic. Um, in this example, the detection logic is a grep expression. So if this regular expression matches the response, we're going to treat it as vulnerable. There is also a collaborator detection method that you, that you might want to play with if you, if you look at this later on. So, if we can try this now, and if we test it, it shows that the, uh, the website is vulnerable. Um. Right, I've just realised that I'm, uh, I need to undo, to demonstrate something that I need to undo the fix that I did before. Okay, now, you, um, this scan didn't find the SQL injection vulnerability. Now, I don't like to rely fully on uh, automated testing, so I like to do a bit of manual testing as well. Now, the, uh, the go-to starting point for any manual testing is a single quote. So if I put a single quote in this field, instantly I get an SQL error message. So this is ringing all sorts of alarm bells about this has got a flaw, and I'm thinking, why hasn't Active Scanner found this? Now, one of the first things I can do to investigate this is to dig the request out of proxy history. We can see in the history, we can see we've submitted the uh, single quote. If we just uh, hover for a second, uh, we get a handy inline URL decode, and we can see the response with the suspicious looking string. Now, if we send this to repeater, what we would expect is that we can send this off again, same payload, and we would expect to get the same result. But we don't. This is forbidden. And this is a bit strange. So if I go back to here, if I refresh the page, if I put in my payload, 
I put in my payload again and get an error message. So what is going on? And we can dig a couple of these uh, requests out of the proxy history and send these to the comparer. So this is going to show us the exact differences. And what we can see is that this token has changed between requests. We've got this dynamic anti-cross-site request forgery token. So what happens is we refresh the page and we get a valid token. We submit one payload and that gets through to the app and triggers the error. But by that point, that token is burned. It's been used and we cannot use it for any further probes. Now, it turns out that Burp's got a uh, useful feature to help us deal with this. And what we can do... I'll just remove these because these, these were set up from earlier. So the first thing we can do is define a macro. So we have this request which would get the uh, search form and the response contains this token. So if I create a macro like this, I can call it fetch CSRF token. Now the next thing I want to do is I want to configure this post request so that every time the post request runs, it's going to fetch a fresh token. Now the first thing I need to do is capture the URL of that request. And then I can create a session handling rule. And I'm going to, I'm going to call this update CSRF token. In the rule action, I want to run a macro. I'll select that macro that I've just defined. And crucially, I'm going to leave this option here enabled, which says update the current request with parameters from the macro response. Now, we also want to define a scope. So I'm going to paste the URL that I, I just copied. And because we're going to use this with replicator down the line, I'm going to enable the extender scope. Okay, so now, if we go back to repeater, what's going to happen when we press go is under the hood, it's going to issue the macro, it's going to fetch that fresh, fetch that fresh token, it's going to update the request we can see here, and then we are going to get a different response. And you can see, you can see each time we do it, token's updating. But it's not just good for repeat of this. We can now send this back to Active Scanner. If we just give this a minute. Yeah. Oh, yep. Yeah. And that one more time. Right. And we've now found the SQL injection floor. Now, this time, if we send this to uh, Replicator, now just as before, it picks up the vulnerability description, it picks up the path, the parameter, it gives us a probe request, it gives us detection logic. But crucially as well, it's identified this session rule which applies to that request. So now when we save this replicator file, embedded in that file is that session rule and that macro. And then when the developer receives this, when they load it, they get that configuration preloaded into BERP, which, which helps them with this sort of, you know, just click and go experience. Now, you cannot rely on Active Scanner to find everything. So um, something else that I tend to do during a test is to use the uh, content discovery function. Now, I know loads of people use Deerbuster and Durban things. Not everyone seems to know that there is a similar functionality built right into BERT, which lets you leverage a whole load of other stuff like those session handling rules. So we can keep that off running. And actually, already after a little while, we've already found something new on the sitemap, this admin page. Oh, I wasn't expecting that. So if we send this... Ah. Uh, if we 
just need to turn on the cookie jar for a pizza. There we go. So, if we request this admin page, even though we were just logged on as the test user with no special privileges, we have got unauthorized access to the admin panel. Now, again, we can send this to Replicator, um, but because this isn't an active scanner generated issue, we have to do a bit more work. Um, so, for instance, we need to write in the issue description ourselves. So. Now, we've got the probe request, but we also need to manually define detection logic. Now, seems to me a pretty fair thing to search on would be the admin panel. So if I, if I select that string, I can then instruct it to use that selection. And now any time that probe request gives you the admin panel, it will trigger a vulnerability. And we can test that now. Now, all these requests have got session IDs in them. And remember I said earlier, one of the problems is, while you're testing that session ID is valid, but down the line the session ID may no longer be valid. Now, we've got some tools here which can help us um, deal with this. So the first thing I'm going to do is, is I'm going to scrub cookies from all these requests. So now I've removed the session ID, so there's no chance that we're corrupting ourselves with sort of having a session ID that won't be valid in the future. Now, that alone won't solve everything because BERP's internal cookie jar will affect things. So I need to also empty that cookie jar. So now we've simulated the situation that all our cookies have expired. And those vulnerabilities are unable to replicate. Now, what we need to do to fix this is define a login macro. So I can go back here. If I look down our history, this is the original post request where we logged in as username test. So I'll define this macro and call it login as test. Now, back in Replicator, we can select a login macro. If we now try it, they all replicate as vulnerable. And now we can have a lot of confidence that if we send this off to a developer, that they will be able to replicate them just the same. Um, there's one other feature um, that's, that's come in handy in some, some situations. Um, so you might have some particular burp config set up that you need to access this. It could be NTLM platform authentication, it could be hostname resolution, it could be all sorts of things. Now we've got the capability here to import some config from the currently running burp instance. So I'm actually going to, from the project options, uh, within connections, I'm going to import the hostname resolution and so this maps the my demo stage into an IP address so if the developer tried to run this and they didn't have this config it wouldn't work so we can save that so now everything can all get packaged up and we can save that as a file now obviously there is a fair amount of confidential stuff in this file um, but You've already got some secure communication mechanism to get your report from your company to your client. So you can just leverage that exact same communication mechanism to send the replicated file as well. And then they've got the ability to reproduce all the issues readily. So that, that's the, uh, that's the workflow for a tester. Um, the key points I thought, first of all, is that there is a list of all the vulnerabilities, that every vulnerability has got a probe. It's got a crafted request which you can prove, use to prove presence or absence of, of the vulnerability. And it's got detection logic, so it can look at the response and it can say, okay, this is vulnerable or this has been resolved. 
And then to support that, it's got a login macro, it's got all the session handling rules, and it's got the relevant sections of your BIP configuration. Now, this, so, so you can serve up a wonderful post-battle banquet. Now, sometimes, even with the best Starship technology, things can go wrong. And one of the scenarios that we envisaged happening was that you would, uh, you'd have um, a developer at one end and say, it just doesn't replicate on my machine. And you've got the pen tester at the other end saying, well, it works for me. And you think, how, how would we resolve this impasse? So we've included a trace feature. So if you're having difficulty replicating an issue, you can turn on the trace feature. So now, once this is turned on, every HTTP request which goes through Burp's network stack and the response that comes back gets recorded in an in-memory log. So you can then repeat all the tests and then when you're done, you can stop tracing and you can save everything to a trace file and you can then send that back to the person who gave you the replicator file and hopefully between you, you can debug it. It, it will still take some degree of skill to debug that. Yeah. So that was all about the extension. Um, I just wanted to add to this about some things I learned about developing extensions. Because this, this is the first like major extension I've written that's ended up being in the BAP store. I've written one-shot extensions before that were to deal with particular technologies, but they'd never, they'd never been released publicly. They were always kind of written to a standard. It's like, well, it works for me now, but if it breaks, tough. So things I've learned that work really well. Um, you really do want to use an IDE to do development, and um, I've certainly found that IntelliJ is very pleasant to use. So compared to Eclipse and NetBeans, it just does a bit more code suggestion, immediate static analysis, automated refactoring, and just all those little bits, they actually add up to making it a much, there's a lot more flow as you're developing. Gradle works really well as a build system. Um, and um, just like Maven, it lets you reference external artifacts from your build files. Um, and this is actually a really handy way to integrate the Burp API. Quite a lot of the extensions have exported all the interface files and kept them in their source code. And this, this works fine. There's no problem with it. It just clutters your source code up. And that's a referencing the artifacts is a really clean way to do it. Um, if you're building forms, while there is an IntelliJ form builder, we've found that the NetBeans form builder is is preferable. And actually, they work together fine. It's absolutely no problem to be editing a form in NetBeans, editing the code in IntelliJ. If you change one, they auto-reload, and it's, it's, it's actually really hard to mess things up. Um, now, something... I'd not done much of at all when I was um, kind of like a pen tester who did a bit of coding, was using a debugger. Now, if you've got your captain breathing down your neck and you need to get your warp nacelles going at warp drive 9 fast, a debugger can greatly help you with that. If you're uh, used to debugging by putting print statements in your code, um, a debugger can really make things a lot easier for you. And I'm going to show you how you can use uh, IntelliJ to um, debug a burp extension. This isn't specific to IntelliJ, but it is... Um, well, I'll show you how to do it with this. Java has this facility to do remote debugging. So if we go into our... Uh, debug configuration. We can create a remote debug session. Now, uh, IntelliJ here gives us the command line we need to use to start Java. So when you start Java with that command line, it will open up a listening port and it will allow a remote debugger to connect to the process. So if I quit out of this instance of BERT, Now 
Now, I can run Java from a, from a command line. I can paste in those command line flags for debugging. And I can start the suite. So I'm just going to like let it start up a little bit. It slows down a little bit when the debug is running, but not, not tons. And uh, when it's started up a bit, I can go back here and attach the debugger to the running process. Now, if you've not used a debugger before, one of the uh, main entry points is a breakpoint. So we can set a line in the code. And in fact, here, I'm going to just set a line which is run when you press the scrub cookies button. So, Okay, so we've got this breakpoint set. So when I click Scrub Cookies, it's going to bounce us back into IntelliJ. So it's frozen the application. And at this point, we can analyze all the currently running data structures. So down the side there, we've got the uh, stat trace. We've got all the local variables on this side. Now, if you did do debugging by printing, what I found happened all the time is you'd print something out, and when you saw the value of that, you'd be like, oh, I wish I'd printed out this as well. But the, the debugger really helps you there because you can just explore all the objects in your current context. And you can just expand as deep as you want. And there's also capabilities to run like inline Java statements. So if you are like a pen tester who codes a bit and you want to up your game and become more of a, more like a professional developer, I would say that learning to use a debugger is really up there with good things to do. Now, something else a few people ask me about is highlighting tabs. Now, you know, you know when you do center repeater, you know how the repeater tab flashes up for a little bit. People have asked, well, hey, I've got an extension. I want to do the same, but there isn't an API to do it. Well, Replicator can do this because although there isn't a burp API, you can still access all the swing components. Now, I'm going to let you into a secret. Since burp 178, that is the exact color you want. If you want your highlight to be an exact color match to the internal tools, that's the color. And if you want to, if you want to get the fine details right, 3,000 milliseconds is how long they highlight for. Now, it turns out actually making them highlight is, is a mild pain in the ass because what you have to do, you've got your tab and you have to walk up the swing hierarchy so you find like the container of all the tabs, then you find the one with your caption. The problem is, when your component's created, it is an orphan. It doesn't have a parent. So what you have to do is register a hierarchy change listener, which is then triggered once your component gets connected to the swing tree. You can then walk up the hierarchy, find the correct tab, highlight it, and when, when activated, you can set up the timer. Now, you may not want to do all this hard work. So... I have created a gist to do this. In fact, if you're into doing extensions, there's quite a few gists on um, the GitHub there. Um, sometimes when people ask for things, if I'm feeling in a good mood, I'll write them a gist to do it. Um, and there's now a reasonable collection of them. Now, another little pet peeve that I see extensions getting wrong is whenever an extension creates a pop-up dialog, it should be given a parent. Now, Swing will let you provide null as a parent. Now, I have this idea that all the extensions that do this, the developers only have one monitor, because we've all got dual monitors at, at Port Swigger, and when you've got Bert running on your right-hand monitor, it's, it really grinds when an extension pops something up on the other monitor. Now, the way around this is to give all these pop-ups a parent. The parent should be the burp frame. Now, again, there's, while there isn't a burp API to fetch this, you can use the standard swing APIs to find the burp frame. And again, there is a gist 
to do that for you. Now, this problem may be familiar to a lot of you because there are so many wonderful burp extensions that you want to add them all. And the navigating your tabs becomes like a skill, a skill all, all of its own. Um, now, what a few extensions are starting to do, people have realised is this, this, this area of the street, this is getting pretty cluttered, but there's still a good bit of space up here. Now, while again, there's no official API to access the menu bar, you can still directly use the Swing API and some extensions, notably um, Active Scan Plus Plus and Backslash Powered Scanner, which uh, recently gained um, graphical configuration screens, but you access them from uh, menus rather than from tabs to reduce the clutter issue. Um, another thing a few people have wondered <coughs> is how uh, an extension like Replicator is able to access these session handling rules and macros and other parts of the config. Now that's down to these two calls that are on the iBurp extender callbacks interface. So save config as JSON takes um, the running burp project configuration, serializes it as, as JSON and returns it as a string to your extension. So you can read any aspect of the configuration and then load config from JSON works the other way around. So you give it JSON as a string and it takes that and it updates the running configuration. Um, it can be a little bit icky to do it because because actually they, there was a lot of configuration options. So this is, there's quite a lot of like nested data, um, but it's very powerful. The one limitation though is there is no change listener. So if you remember earlier where we needed to create that login macro to make our replicator file reproducible, now, when we switch back to the Replicator tab, the drop-down had the name of the macro there immediately. Well, the only way the extension manages to do that is every time the tab activates, it redoes save config as JSON, just on the off chance you change something. Now, there was one final thing which um, uh, was quite subtle, and you, you, you might not have noticed, but... Um, I'm just going to turn off this breakpoint while I uh, while I do this. Now, um, when we click test, the token updates. So it's F3B. Click it again. C19. Now, I thought it was it was a really helpful feature of the UI that that screen updates based on all the session handling rules because it gives you confidence that your session handling rules are working. However, again, there isn't, um, there isn't a direct API uh, to do this. But you can cobble together some other pieces of the API to get the effect. So if you register an iHttp listener, you get a callback, you get process HTTP message and that gets the message just as it's ready to be sent on to the destination web server. So a, a tool within Burp says it wants to send the request. Then any session handling rules, platform authentication, A and other things, get the opportunity to modify the request before it goes. And just as it's ready to go, process HTTP message gets the final request. So we've got the original request, which is in the text box in the URI. We've got this final request that's going to the web server. The last piece of the puzzle is how do we connect the two messages? There isn't, unfortunately, on process HTTP message, you do not get like a request ID. This is an often requested feature, but currently it's not there. <coughs> so instead, what the extension does is just before you send it, it adds a header. It's like X replicator ID, and it puts in a random value. And then within the process HTTP message, if it sees this header, it first of all, it strips that out so it doesn't go to the target web server, but it uses that to update the UI. And this 
gives you the effect where you can see immediately the effect that all your session handling rules are having. So there you go. A few tricks. You've got all the tools now to run your SDLC at warp speed. You may have some questions about this, which are welcome, and I'd just like to leave you with these final thoughts. Jordan. Yeah, you said you, uh, you developed the, the original extension for replicators. Yeah. When? Uh, over the past few months. So I first had, <coughs> I first had the idea um, in the final months when I was working at Pentest, and I thought, oh, this will, this will be great. You know, I'll, ha I'll have the opportunity to do this like in a, in an even more conducive environment. And then in in the first couple of weeks, I said to Daph, hey, this would this would be a really cool feature, and. Um, as quite often happens when we discuss these things, Daff, Daff will come back and say, well, this would be good if it can do this and this and this. It would have to do this to be good. And so I thought about this and I realized it didn't need to be a core feature and it could be done as an extension. And then, <coughs> yeah, it's sort of as a back burner project, it came together. Any, any questions would be good. As a developer, how would you interpret this as a SE? So you've got uh, an issue that needs to be set to show to show that the other issue is fixed. Where is it fixed? Do you have a test? Yeah. Right. So, yeah. So this current version doesn't support unattended running. So you couldn't you couldn't put this like in a Jenkins pipeline. Um, a few people have requested that. Um, they, personally, I, I think for doing like agile security, um, you're better using scanners. I know there's some merit in checking that you've not broken the same things you've broken before, but I think there's a lot more merit, um, in, in using scanners and setting up, um, I mean, whether you want to use BERT with the, Carbonator plugin, or you know, or whatever tooling, but having having ongoing scanning as part of your pipeline. Oh, so so if. So if this could be integrated in the pipeline, this would automatically give you the ta the failing test that you need as the yeah. so that so you were doing like full TDD there. Yeah. Oh right, well that's that's a <coughs> that's a good suggestion. Thank you. W would that do the trick for you then? Uh, if you could run it automatically through something like Jenkins, yeah. Right. Hello. Sure. Um, I mean, would it just be enough if, if you could do it like on the command line and you just got some like XML output on the command line? Would that be enough to script it? Yeah, I don't know. Do you do you segregate your pipelines? Do you have like a sort of a fast and a long pipeline or something? Yeah, I mean, I've always thought one of the issues with doing agile security is a scanner does want to run quite a lot of payloads against your app. And especially as you're sometimes worried about kind of 
spooky action at a distance. You know, that you might want to do a security scan of the entire product just in case a change here had a far reaching change. Sure. Yeah. Unfortunately, this this thing will always would always require Burke to start up because it's using all the logic in the session handling rules. Um, I mean, there is. Um, I don't know if you've used the. Um, there's a feature to copy as a curl command. So if you've got something that's relatively simple to replicate, that you know that doesn't require a login session and stuff, you could copy that as a curl command. That would be a one liner for you. Okay, that's, that's all the time for questions. I think it's lunchtime now, so enjoy. Come and find me later on if you want to know more. <laughs>